practice. When I was in college, there was a knock on my dorm room door. And I opened the door, and it was some guy I didn't know. I'd never seen him before. He doesn't introduce himself. He doesn't say his name. He doesn't ask my name. He just says this, you need to stop smoking pot, stop sleeping with your girlfriend, and come to Jesus. And I was like, what? <laughs> and he said, you heard me. You need to stop smoking pot, stop sleeping with your girlfriend, and come to Jesus. I was like, you don't know me. And he was like, oh, I know you. And you need to stop smoking pot. And I was like, I've never smoked pot in my life. And he's like, and you need to stop sleeping with your girlfriend. And I was like, she lives eight hours away. And, and, and he just was like, nope, you know, you know the message. You need to stop smoking pot, stop sleeping with your girlfriend, and come to Jesus. At this point, at this time, by the way, when I was in college, pot was actually illegal. So it's, you know, maybe a little different. Um, and... Uh, I was, I was really taken aback, and so finally I said to him, I said, look, um, I'm a Christian. And he goes, brother. And he gave me this big hug, and I was like, what is going on? What, I, I don't understand. Like, the message that he brought to me, stop smoking pot, stop sleeping with your girlfriend, come to Jesus, I, I didn't immediately recognize that as the good news about Jesus. <laughs> you know what I mean? I wasn't like, that sounds great wow, tell me more. Uh, instead, I was like, who is this horrible person who has inserted himself into my life? And uh, sometimes, sometimes, I think we can experience that on one side or the other, right? Sometimes we're the guy knocking on the door, and sometimes we're the person answering. And I, I think it can go either way. And what, what uh, I understand you all have been talking about the last, notice how I said you all, I, I can't quite get to y'all yet. Um, you've been doing this Love One series, right? Where uh, I think the first week you talked about identify, meeting people where they're at, that uh, Jesus went to Levi uh, and ate with sinners and invited them to follow. Uh, this is right, right? Okay. Okay, good, good. Uh, and then we talked about interceding, the life of prayer that Jesus taught us and talked about the Lord's Prayer. And then last week, investing, that Jesus met both physical and spiritual needs uh, when he fed the 5,000. And today, today we're going to talk about imparting. Imparting just means what we're communicating to people. How, how, the words we say, the way we act, what is that telling people around us? And we're going to look at a story about Jesus where we see it's actually a really fascinating story, a story that shows how Jesus responded with grace and truth in situations with people, both of which can be operations of love. Grace can be about love. Truth can be about love. But together, uh, they can really be a powerful way to talk about love. And we're going to talk about how do we avoid the traps, the traps of religion, uh, religion meaning not just following Jesus, but, but the trappings of religion, right? Uh, like the Pharisees, the people who had all the rules and the culture and the different things that, were, uh, that they would say is necessary to come to Jesus that Jesus would not say. Uh, so how do we avoid the traps of religion? How do we avoid traps of politics and putting that above Jesus? How do we avoid traps of uh, social media and, and the way we can sometimes come across there? We're going to talk about all those things uh, by looking at a story from the book of John where we see Jesus uh, interacting with religion and politics, and also being on Snapchat. Uh, I'm just kidding. There's no Snapchat in the Bible uh, that I have yet found, I'm sure. I haven't read it all. We'll see. Um, John chapter 8 is where we're going to be. So if you have your Bibles, you can take a look at John chapter 8. I'll give you time to turn there. I'm not in any hurry. We're here all morning. John chapter 8, and... Uh, if you want to just take my word for what it says, you can just listen. <laughs> I know you're nervous now because I said that thing about Snapchat, but <laughs> here we go. John chapter 8, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and at dawn he appeared in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he began to teach. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, who were the religious keepers, they weren't bad guys, they were people who were doing their best to follow God. Uh, and they were very serious about it. They were the ones we would go to when we had spiritual questions. 
the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman who had been caught committing adultery. And they made her stand before the group, the whole group, all the people Jesus was teaching. So they shamed her, right? And they said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And in the law, Moses commanded us to stone women like this, which isn't actually true. Uh, it's sort of interesting what they're doing here. They're, they're referring to a law from Scripture. They're talking about the Bible. Uh, it's in Deuteronomy 22, 22. You can look it up later. And, but what it said was this, if a man and a woman are caught uh, in the act of adultery, stone them both. Uh, so it's really interesting. They caught this woman together with a man. They said, in the act. And somehow they just brought the woman to Jesus and said, should we kill her? Uh, I wonder what's happening there. Now, maybe the man was just a very fast runner. I'm not sure. <laughs> it could be. Uh, but what I think is more likely is that there's a function here of sexism and that these people have found someone who is vulnerable uh, and brought her as a message, a way of saying uh, she's expendable, that she can be used to make their point. Now, I think Jesus is aware of all these things. <laughs> and what he does is so interesting. So they say, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, and in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. And what do you say? What do you say, teacher? What should we do? All the people love you. They're all gathered around listening. What do you say? What should be done? And they were using this question, it says, as a trap. So they, had a, so they would have a basis for accusing him. Because what they're trying to say, if someone brought somebody in today, and they said, uh, to our service, right now, while I was teaching, they brought somebody in, and they said, this person... Um, did something that deserves the death penalty, whatever that thing is, should we as a church just take care of that right now? Or uh, what do you say? What, what they're trying to do with Jesus is the same thing. If we killed someone as a church, if we as a community decided to do that today, and I see several of you are ready, you're like, okay, bring them in. <laughs> um, if we were to do that today, what would happen? We would be very famous and many of us would be in jail, right? Because we're not allowed to in our civil world and our government and the way it's set up. This is not something that we're allowed to do. We don't get to make those justice decisions as a church. And they were doing the same thing to Jesus. They were saying, under the Roman Empire, we're not allowed to stone people. Like, we crucify them. Well, the government crucifies them. We're not allowed to do that anymore. Uh, but also, the Bible says this. So the question is, do you want to go against the government so that we can accuse you of doing something terrible and you can probably go to jail? Or do you hate the Bible? Which is it? Are you against the government or do you hate the Bible? That's what they're saying to Jesus. And Jesus, of course, being who he is, never falls into a trap. Uh, so, so Jesus, it says, bent down and he started to write on the ground with his finger. And verse 7 says, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said, tell you what, whoever's without sin, get us started. You just throw, just one of you, whichever one of you is without sin, grab a rock and go for it. And uh, then he bends down and he starts writing on the ground again. And it's so interesting. This is the only place in scripture we see Jesus writing or drawing, we don't know, it could be, I don't, I don't know, it could be a picture of a cat or something, we're not sure. Uh, but what a lot of different theologians say, they're like, he was writing maybe the sins of the people who were standing there. Or he was writing, maybe he just wrote their names and let them know he knew who they were. Or maybe he just wrote the Ten Commandments and let them look at that and go like, oh, right, uh, there are some other things that there could be penalties for. Or maybe he just wrote, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Maybe that was it. Maybe that was enough. But whatever happened, what Jesus did is he took a moment to share truth with these men. What he was saying is, 
Are you better than this woman? Are you different than her? And if we follow all these rules that you're trying to put me in the corner with, how long till you're going to be on the wrong end of the rocks? What do you want to do here? Where do you want to push this? Where do you want to take it? And of course, what happens at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The oldest first. The oldest first, I don't know, because they were the wisest or because they've been around long enough to do more stuff. I'm not sure. But the oldest started to leave first. And they were followed by the younger until only, only Jesus was left. And this woman, the woman still standing there. And Jesus stands up and he asks her woman, which was polite at the time, by the way. It wasn't like when this changes over time, right? For Jesus to say woman, what he was saying was more like miss, excuse me, miss. Like if I said to my mom, woman, make me a sandwich, that would be rude. <laughs> yeah? Um, but he was saying more like miss or ma'am. So he says, uh, where are they, miss? Has no one condemned you? Didn't you sin? Don't you deserve a punishment? Where'd they go? I thought you were caught in adultery, but no one's throwing rocks. What happened? And she says, he, so he says, has no one condemned you? And she says, no one, sir. And then he says, then I don't condemn you either. And he tells her, go now and leave your life of sin, which is this astonishing response. Think about it for a minute. Think about a sin in your life. Maybe something you haven't dealt with yet. Maybe something nobody knows. Think about it. When you imagine someone finding out about that and bringing it up to the front of this church and saying, look what Matt has done. Do you then imagine God going, I don't condemn you for that? Man, I don't. I'll tell you the voice I hear when I think of that is, stop smoking pot, Stop sleeping with your girlfriend and come to Jesus. And I think for a lot of us, that's true. The first thing we hear, the way that we lean, is toward this idea that when this all comes out, it's going to be bad and there's going to be judgment. And it's not that that's not true, but notice that the first thing Jesus says to the Pharisees is truth. The first thing he says to them is, uh, are you better than this woman? Are you without sin? That's where he starts. And with the woman where he starts is, I don't condemn you for this. Grace. And then truth. Don't do this anymore. <laughs> I won't always be here every time the Pharisees are, you know, <laughs> cruising the neighborhood with rocks. <laughs> but he starts with grace. And he moves to truth with her. And I think I have to, I have to acknowledge the fact that in my life, my expectation is that in the religious community, everyone's going to start with truth and maybe, maybe, maybe get to grace. And I, I'm part of that, right? I experience that too. Uh, I experience it meaning I also do that. And people around us expect this because this is a message that we as a religious community have communicated for year upon year upon year. I was at a college event uh, gosh, last, last year, maybe two years ago. And one of the things, I was on stage, it was an outreach, so there were a lot of uh, people who weren't followers of Jesus in the audience. And I kept saying from the stage, whoever you are, whatever's happening, you can follow Jesus. Whatever's happening in your life, you can follow Jesus. And afterwards, this kid comes up to me, college kid, and he says, hey, my name's Mark. And I said, hey, Mark. And he goes, do you believe what you were saying on the stage? I said, yeah, I believe that. He goes, so you believe that I can follow Jesus? I was like, absolutely. And he had this look on his face like he was about to prove me wrong, right? That I was in a corner. And I was like, what is the trap here? What's about to happen? And he pulls his sleeve back like this, and he has like a rainbow bracelet on. And I, I was looking at it, and I was looking at him, trying to figure out what was happening. And he goes, now do you think I can follow Jesus? And I was like... I mean, you are allowed to wear rainbow bracelets and follow Jesus, yes. <laughs> and he's like, no, man, I am the president of the LGBT club here on campus. Do you think I can follow Jesus? And I got this big smile on my face, and without any hesitation, I said, of course you can. And he was 
terrified. Because what was supposed to happen was I was supposed to start laying out all this moral code for him and explaining to him everything he was doing wrong in life and how he couldn't come to Jesus. And instead I said, there's grace, you can come to Jesus. And he was like, whoa, this is not the conversation I wanna be in. And I said, I like grabbed him by the arms. I said, let's talk about how you can come to Jesus. He was like, oh no. <laughs> no, not that. This is going the wrong way. And I was like, you have fallen into my trap, (laughs) right? And we had an amazing conversation, a wonderful conversation, because where we started with was the grace that Jesus says, we're all sinners when we come to him. There's nobody who gets, so many times what people hear is, get yourself fixed and then come to Jesus. If you could get yourself fixed, why are you coming to Jesus? Why do we say that message? And what happened is Mark, along the way, in these conversations that he had had with people in the community of faith, what he had heard over and over is you cannot come to Jesus because of who you are. You cannot come to Jesus because of what you're doing. Because of the church. Because of us. That breaks my heart. Breaks my heart. Yeah, and... and Someone like Mark, it might be a long time before we go from grace to truth with Mark, because it's going to take him a long time to hear the grace. And we might spend many, many months, maybe even years, saying to Mark over and over, God loves you, and I love you, and you can come to Jesus. And that might be the truth he most needs. Not the things that Mark has heard over and over from us before that. Remember that Scripture says it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance, not His judgment. There is judgment. That's true. We don't need to avoid that. We don't need to hide that. But it's His kindness that leads us to repentance, knowing that He loves us no matter what we do, right? So... These people were trying to trap Jesus in this moment with this woman, this poor woman. Uh, And people are trying to trap us too, all the time. All the time. There are people in our culture putting us in this exact same situation. Uh, Well, maybe not exact same, (laughs) a very similar situation. Should we stone this woman or do you hate the Bible? Are you going to speak up for Jesus on Facebook, or do you hate the Bible? Are you going to speak up about your politics, or do you hate the Bible? Right? And people are saying these things to us all the time, and I constantly, constantly have to ask myself, what did Jesus do in this situation? Did did he fall into the trap of saying this is an either or? No. He said, let's look at the people involved here. Let's focus on them. And, And... If he starts with truth, it's almost always with the religious community. If he has something harsh to say, it's almost always with us. And when it's people who are searching, when it's people who are lost, when it's people who are broken, he always starts, without exception, with grace. And he gets to truth along the way. He does both. But with us, sometimes he starts with truth and then gets to grace, which sometimes that can be hard. So I, I want to share an example from this week, and it's sensitive, uh, and that's okay, because I'm going to start with truth with us, okay? Uh, and, and it's about social media, so some of you are like, oh, I'm not on social media, this will not apply to me. Okay, good. Um, this last week, I'm on Facebook, and many, many, many of my Christian friends were posting about the change of law in New York about abortion. Really heartfelt, uh, sometimes beautiful things about the importance of human life, which I agree with, which this church agrees with, that God has made human beings and they are worthy of respect and to be protected, uh, that babies are important. I love babies so much. I, I have three. Well, I mean, they're old now, but, um, and I wanted more, and my wife said, just not with her. Um, <laughs> And I felt like that was a trap. So (laughs) I just stuck with the three. Um, Babies are wonderful. They're amazing. They're incredible. Um, 
And, and there is, a, a, I believe, a really godly desire to protect them and to talk about that. But what I noticed in my social media this week, over and over and over and over and over, and again this morning, um, people saying how evil and terrible and awful and destructive abortion is, which it is. Uh, but do you know what I never saw ever, not once, not a single time, was something like this. Hey, if you've had an abortion, I'm really sorry. I'm sorry you were put in that situation. I'm sorry we weren't there to help you. I'm, and God loves you, and I love you. And did, did you know that one in four adult women in the United States have had an abortion? One in four. And that 40% of abortions every year in the United States uh, are women who are uh, regularly attending Christian church. Do you know what that means? That means 100% chance there is a woman right now in this room who's had an abortion, 100%, more than one woman, 100% chance that one of your Facebook friends, even though you don't know it, has had an abortion, 100% chance. There's a 100% chance that someone in your neighborhood, that this is true of them, and we went all in on truth, all in. And do you know what that felt like to women who've had abortions? Gosh, it just felt like stones. It just felt like rocks hitting them over and over. And I know, because I have friends who've told me this. I have friends who message me and say, I can't be on Facebook this week. Let me know when it's over. Uh, because we leaned hard on truth. And we didn't bring the grace. Now, I'm not reading your Facebook. None of you are Facebook friends with me. Uh, but I, I, I want to say this. If that is true, if that's been true on your Facebook wall, it's not too late. Like, it's not like, I think what happens is we get caught up in this idea that grace and truth are in opposition to each other, but they're not. They complement each other. So if you went hard in on truth this last week, man, this week is your week to go hard in on grace and send a message out to people who may have heard something different than what you intended to say, we love you. We want you in our community. You're welcome here. I know that was hard, and we should have been with you along the way. And I'm sorry we weren't. Or I'm sorry that you've... 75% of women who say they come from the church and end up getting an abortion said the reason they never discussed it at church is because they knew it would start with judgment. It wouldn't be like, babies are amazing, we love babies, let's take care of you. It would have been like, how dare you do this thing? Should we stone her? Should we stone her, right? Nothing about the guy. Because that's not how we do it. Yeah, so, so all that to say, all that to say, and this is just one example. The, every day, people are trying to put us in the corner. People are trying to trap us into sit, saying something or doing something that makes, uh, you have to speak the truth or you hate the Bible. You have to speak the truth or you hate Jesus. And what if the answer is like Jesus, that we step back and we draw in the dirt and we say, <laughs> just a minute here. Let the person without sin make the first post, right? Well, what if we step back enough to say, there are terrible things in the world that people do or that are done to them, but God loves you and there is grace along the way. What, what if that is who we were? And I understand it's hard. And, and, and <laughs> this is why we have a family rule that I'm not allowed to make posts or send emails while angry. Uh, because they, uh, well, they always cause trouble. Um, and, and I even have friends that sometimes I throw, uh, I throw things. No, I don't throw things. <laughs> I send them my posts ahead of time so they can tell me, am I being kind? Am I being loving? Am I being honest? Am I being honest? So we try not to fall 
into the trap. And I think you could be thinking right now, Matt, it seems like you're saying a lot about grace and not much about truth. I, I'll give you that honestly. Because I think, I think right now in the church, we're doing good on truth. Overall, we've learned how to do it. We're strong in it. And I, I think we're struggling on the grace side. Maybe because we haven't experienced it ourselves. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But it's not an either or. We don't have to pick. That's not true. So I guess I want to say this. If you're here today and you've uh, had an abortion, man, we love you. We're so sorry that you were in a place that you had to make that choice. We're so sorry that we weren't there with you and that you didn't know that we wanted to care for you, to be there with you, whatever you decided. We're sorry. We love you. You're welcome here. We're glad you're here. If you're gay, if you've messed up sexually in some way, if you have a secret sin, if you've been... Uh, abused and told you're worthless and you believe that. If you're a Pharisee, if you're a legalist, we love you. We're glad you're here. We're thankful you're here. You're welcome in this community. God loves you and we love you. Scripture says in Christ we are not condemned. And Jesus shows that in this story. He turns and looks at this woman and says, if they don't condemn you, neither do I. Something unexpected, even for me. I've been in the church my whole life, and every time I read that story, I'm like, wait, that's what he said? Because I don't know him that well, I guess, at the end of the day. I don't believe he's that good. So let me share one last thing that is both grace and truth for all of us. In Jesus, in Jesus, whatever you have done, whatever has been done to you, whatever you're planning to do or debating about doing, in Jesus, there's forgiveness. That's a grace to us. And it is deeply, deeply true. I'm going to pray in just a moment here, but before I do, I know that I was very honest with you about some hard things this morning. I gave you truth, <laughs> but I want to say there's grace too. And uh, during the, uh, after this, as we're singing another song, there's a, there's a little thing back here that says need prayer. If you need to talk to someone, there will be men and women available. Just come grab somebody. Uh, let them know what you're dealing with, what you're thinking about. And we, I'll be there too. We'd be glad to pray with you. We'd be thrilled uh, because of the grace of Christ on all of us. Let me pray for us.